Hello and welcome to Revision Tips for SIPs Level 3, Advanced Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations. This is Module 5, which is the Socially Responsible Procurement Module, and Learning Outcome 3, which is to know the implications of CSR for the procurement and supply function. So we want to identify procurement and supply functions and practices that organisation may adopt to support corporate social responsibility. Look at the triple bottom line concept and how that applies and the metrics that can be used to measure and report. Now CSR policies can also be referred to as sustainability policies and guidelines. These policies issue the standards and processes that organisations expect to achieve. They can be used to provide guidance on best practice as well as the rules that should be followed. Corporate governance is needed in order to successfully implement CSR activities and ensure that the activities of an organisation and its supply chain are conducted while adhering to ethical, legal and professional standards. Supply chain management plays a large role in the adoption of these CSR policies, both within an organisation and those of its suppliers and business partners. Many organisations publish their CSR objectives and resulting achievements. The organisation's mission, vision and underlying values will feed into the procurement policies and procedures that support the company's CSR. Konica and Minota periodically ask their suppliers and production sites to participate in CSR activities such as completing self-assessment questionnaires in order to drive improvements. The United Nations International Standard Organization and the OECD have all developed international guidelines for implementation, which may, many organizations follow voluntarily. But then you've got the work of organizations code of conduct and the code of ethics. So here on the, the screen, we can look at the SIPS Code of Ethics. Organisations that adopt this code need to commit to understanding and commitment, ensuring that the business ethics across the organisation are understood at all levels, enhancing the knowledge of relevant laws and regulations, and committing to eradicating unethical business practices, including bribery, fraud, corruption, human rights abuses, such as modern slavery and child labour. They also need to commit to ethical practice, conducting all business relationships with respect, honesty and integrity, avoiding harm to others as a result of business decisions. Treat all stakeholders fairly, impartially, without discrimination. Actively supporting and promoting CSR and avoiding any business practices that might bring the procurement profession into disrepute. Moving on to professionalism, use procurement strategies to drive unethical practices from a supply chain. Ensure procurement decisions minimise any negative impacts on human rights and the environment whilst endeavouring to maximise value and service levels. Put ethical practices, policies and procedures in place which should be regularly monitored and updated mandating the education and training of all your staff that are involved in sourcing and supply selection and practicing due diligence on your business undertakings. The final part is to commit to accountability. This is to accept accountability and take ownership for your business ethics. Foster a culture that's, I suppose, built on leadership by example. Take as much steps as you can to prevent, report and remedy any unethical practices and provide a safe environment for the reporting of unethical practices. So please do take a look at the SIPS Code of Ethics. Check the areas that it covers and then ask yourself, why do you think SIPS has decided they're important? Now we'll look at social, ecological and economic impacts. Companies have traditionally focused on reporting their performance in financial terms. 
but recently there's been a shift to reporting on the ecological and social impacts in order to assess the complete business performance. In 2017, 78% of large companies issued some form of reporting that incorporated ecological and social impacts. They're the largest 250 companies worldwide. The bodies that report in sustainability fields include um, GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative, the IIRC, International Integrated Reporting Council, and the SASB, which is the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. So the GRI, the, the Global Reporting Initiatives, we can see the diagrams on <clears throat> the slide now. These provide reporting guidelines. One of the most used ratings to measure environmental impacts, but it also encompasses the three spheres, the economic, sustainable and environmental. Continuously being improved as knowledge evolves and the priorities of its reporters and report users change. In addition, the GRI provides a certificated training course on its standards for user organisations. So perhaps do some research on some of those uh, organisations that I mentioned. Social impact is the impact an organisation has on its community. Organisations seek to eradicate the negative impacts and make positive contributions where possible on areas such as the working conditions, fair trade businesses, education and uplift and sustainable business policy. The impact that an initiative can make can be measured according to who or what will benefit from it. The opportunities to create positive social impacts at each step in the pro process while achieving economic environmental objectives, like setting minimum standards for social impacts that suppliers must achieve in order to qualify for selection. And then looking at the value for money aspects previously determined by considering the total cost over lifetime of an item or service, but the social outcomes are now integrated into your procurement life cycle. And there are two main approaches to it. Firstly, the direct approach. This will involve purchasing from social benefit entities such as the not-for-profit, social enterprises, minority owned businesses, disadvantaged workers or community-based organizations. But the indirect approaches will include social clauses in contracts with private sector providers, screening their supply chain for ethical and labour practices, as well as em emphasising their commitment to small medium enterprises in the use of their subcontractors. The nature of the social impacts that are sought in procurement process will determine which supplier could best deliver that type of social benefit. If the aim is to generate employment and training, for marginalised groups, then a social enterprise with a successful history of creating job opportunities may be your potential supplier. However, if the aim is to build economic participation, the target market may consist of emerging business owners, such as women groups, minority groups, or even disadvantaged groups. Now, the International Organization of Standards um, introduced ISO 26000, providing guidance on how a socially responsible enterprise or organization can and should work with implementation, stakeholder involvement, due diligence and communication on its CSR performance. It includes definitions, backgrounds, principles, and seven core subjects that can be considered in social responsibility. So starting in the center, you've got organizational governance, human rights, labor practices, the environment, fair operating practices, consumer issues, and community involvement and development. ISO 26000 has become one of the key references for implementing social responsible practices in organizations. It's been adopted nationally in 80 countries across more than 20 different languages and was one of the sets of guidelines upon which the European Commission 
build its social responsibility strategy. The triple bottom line, sometimes referred to as integrated reporting, an accounting framework that incorporates three dimensions of performance. So we'll start with the people, the social dimensions of the community or region. So the examples of the measures here include unemployment rate, the female labour force, household income, poverty, percentage of population with a post-secondary degree or certificate, commute times, crimes per headcount, and health adjusted life expectancy. The planet element measures the impact on the environment. This is concerned with the size of the company's ecological footprint and how to limit it. It also relates to the use of resources such as air, water, but also its consumption and management, including waste and land use. Ideally having targets on benchmarks for each environmental variable would help an organization identify the impact a procurement or policy will have on these issues. Companies that are dedicated to the triple bottom line concept avoid activities that harm the environment and seek ways out to reduce the negative impact their operation may have on an ecosystem. So it's all to do with kind of pollutions in the air, excessive nutrients, consumption of fossil fuels, waste management and yet land use. The Finally, the profit one, the economic measures that deal with the flow of money. Typical measures of profit relate to internal profit and uses figure, figures such as income and expenditure, taxation, business climate factors, employment and business diversity factors. The triple bottom line considers how an organisation's profits will empower and sustain the community, not just the flow towards the shareholders. It's the last economic impact the organisation has on the local economy so the examples will look at things like personal income, cost of employment, establishment churn and size, job growth, employment distribution by sector, as well as the percentage of firms in each of those sectors and the revenue that's contributed towards our gross national product. Energy consumption will include electricity, oil and gas, and it's measured with units such as joules, kilowatt hours, air separation units, gigawatt hours, and equivalent oil related measures. But other measures that com companies set targets on are energy efficiency and the ratio between renewable energy against the energy used from traditional sources. So the sustainability reporting cycle you can see on the screen goes through four stages. The first is to define your goals and metrics. The second is to measure by using data to collect what you're doing. Third, to evaluate, analyzing and reporting on what you've measured. And finally, to manage. And this comes down to performance management. Water consumption is an important consideration. If you're tracking water related performance, you need to determine the most appropriate approach for defining water use, depending on your industry. So some will use gallons or liters, some will go per day per year. But normalizing water data with revenue production levels or numbers of employees often provide a clearer comparison across facilities over time. It measures inputs and outputs by metering in order to provide accurate information about the volume of water flowing in and out of your company's operations. Greenhouse gas emissions contribute to the carbon footprint. Greenhouse gas emissions include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, 
and calculate your carbon footprint measures all greenhouse gas emissions associated with the life cycle of a product service or a business operation. Organisations report on their carbon footprint for carbon registration and reporting, to provide data for carbon offsetting and clean energy product projects, to provide environmental sustainability information to their stakeholders, including customers, but also to identify problem areas to reduce future emissions. And just to remind you about the three scopes. Scope one, determine your direct emissions from your own activities. Scope two, the indirect emissions from the energy purchased. And the final one, the indirect emissions from sources that are not owned by your organization. That's usually when you outsource something. So the other company is creating a direct emission from their activities, but they're doing it on your behalf. Waste footprint is the data that's collected on the amount of waste generated each year and a total waste footprint will then be generated. The figure calculation shows the contribution of primary and secondary packaging minus national recycling and recovery rates. But it also accounts for product left so leftovers. So the product left behind in the primary pack when the consumer discards of it. Manufacturing industries classify and measure waste in three ways. Waste generation in manufacturing and distribution. Waste recovered and recycled. And residual waste sent to landfills. Have a think about your own domestic carbon footprint. You can use an online calculator but you'll need access to the, your, your utility bills to populate that, that, um, that calendar calculator. And the final one for today is the social and economic metrics. <clears throat> Let's start with the social ones first. Track an organization's performance on equality, justice and other social impacts. Statements of social policy goals are usually given rather than attempting to measure areas such as social benefit and community impact. Input is normally measured in social performance. So for example, employee training or activities that involve the community. The definition of minority or disadvantaged groups depends on a country's infrastructure, but also its culture and its regional history. In many countries, these definitions may include the physical, disabled, single parent, youth and ethnic minorities and people aged over 50. The disadvantaged and vulnerable groups often lack access to jobs that can help them earn a living for themselves and their families. So organisations that operate in regions with a high concentration of disadvantaged and vulnerable groups can provide employment, thereby creating a positive social impact. The economic impacts can be positive or negative and reported on a local, national or regional level. But the metrics looks at, does the organisation stimulate the local economy? Because it could lead to increased population, the income and the opportunities. Do they attract workers from other regions causing migration flows, which will clearly change the local demographic structure? Do you use local labour? This is a key driver of organisations such as Fairtrade, who also ensure that sustainable market prices are paid for products and that workers are paid a fair wage and have an appropriate level of working conditions. And then finally, do organisations employ or have opportunities for all genders? A local gender imbalance can totally undermine social cohesion. Thanks for watching this session. <laughs>